All right, last time we were looking at, and I believe completed, the doctrine of the holiness of God. Keep in mind we only are dealing with Old Testament studies in Old Testament theology. But this will help you to understand what is meant in the New Testament by holiness. The word translated to be holy or to sanctify does not mean that at all. As we see from the Hebrew, it means to be separated or consecrated. And when Jesus said in John 17, I sanctify myself, he really didn't say that. What he said was, I consecrate myself. Because sanctification does not, the basic meaning does not mean holy, or he would be saying he was going to make himself holy, which of course is impossible. He's already holy. The derived meaning of the term is holiness because God is holy, or righteous, or pure. All right, now we come to another Old Testament doctrine, and that is the righteousness of God. Keep in mind that you can't understand the New Testament fully without understanding the basic revelation, because the revelation came to Israel. God didn't give a new revelation in the New Testament. It's a completed revelation. All right, now the basic terms we'll give you are, well, I'll give the Hebrew and then we can transliterate them. Sadiq, which means to be righteous or just. And then Sadiq are the feminine Sedekah, which uh, is the noun, righteousness and justice. And then the ad adjective is sadiq. The one that you see the most is righteous, the adjective righteous. The adjective is righteous or just. So as you can see, the noun means, the word means both righteousness and justice. Or to speak of a just person, you're speaking of a righteous person. Or a just act is a righteous act. Now the root meaning, the original meaning of righteousness in the Bible, the word means to be straight. Just like, uh, like a line would be straight means to be straight. Now that'll be significant in a moment after we say a few other things. Now in the moral sense, see that's the original meaning, the root meaning. You have to come to understand root meanings of words like holiness to understand really uh, what you're talking about or the Bible is talking about. Righteousness doesn't mean, well whatever you may think it means, it doesn't mean that basically it means a straight line or something that's firm like a foundation. Now, in the moral sense, when it's applied morally or spiritually, it means uprightness. It means the state of being right. And thus becomes the standard to which man's conduct should conform. It means rectitude, rightness, and comes to be the standard by which men's conduct is to be measured. Now, God's righteousness is his own moral holiness and perfection of character. God's righteousness is his own moral holiness and perfection of character, which is the standard for all men. There are certain passages that speak of God as being just and righteous. I'll read them. You won't have to look them up. Like Deuteronomy 32.4. He is the rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are judgment. He's a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Right or righteous. See, righteous is the state of being right and just. Psalm 11.7 says the same thing. For the, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. So there he's called righteous. Now in Amos 5.24, for example... God tells us to be righteous. Remember, his righteousness is the standard to which our conduct and character and life is to conform. Now, to help you understand then what righteousness is, you go back to this meaning of righteousness being a straight line. Then you see anything out of conformity to that, any conduct that is out of conformity, you see, is unrighteous. 
See, everything has to measure to that straight line, that standard. So anything that deviates from it, which is a symbol of man's conduct, crooked and out of line and so forth. And so to say God demands us be righteous, then the sinner's going to say, well, what does that mean? So what do you tell him? Well, you know, that means, well, what does it mean? And so now you can tell him that God is holy and pure and truth and does not sin. His character and conduct is the standard to which we are to conform. And righteousness basically means that which is straight. And everything is to conform to it. And so that which it conforms to it is parallel to it, of course. That's the way right conduct is. Now, in the non-moral usage of righteousness, it indicates that this term, these terms for righteousness and justice, in the non-moral usage, it indicates that it is conformity to an acceptable standard. It's interesting how the Hebrew language uses moral terms in non-moral senses, and that confirms the usage in the moral sense. For example, the Old Testament speaks of righteous weights and measures. Now, what does he mean? Measures and weights and balances that conform to a right standard. You see that in uh, Deuteronomy 25:15 and in Ezekiel 46, 10 to 12. In other words, in the non-moral usage of terms, just like we saw the non-moral usage of holiness, that even the prostitutes were called holy in the Old Testament, the pagan prostitutes and sodomites were called holy. That is, the term translated holy was used of them. So obviously it can't mean moral purity the term that is translated, really mistranslated, sanctify and so forth in the King James Version, should have been translated consecration because, see, they were consecrated to immoral purposes, dedicated to that. And so you have to come to basic meanings to understand really what's being said. Or you're not really helping people to tell them to be holy. You should tell them be consecrated to God. Since he is morally pure, then if you're consecrated to him, you'll be morally pure. Then when you speak of holiness, then you mean that by holiness. You're consecrated to a pure God. And so with righteousness, uh, righteousness, what is it? It's conformity to a, a certain standard, and the standard is God. Deuteronomy 25, 15 says, You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have. Well, that's the way it's translated, but a perfect and righteous weight, you see. It's the word for righteousness, or the adjective righteous. The same in Ezekiel 45, uh, 10 to 12, that in the non-moral usage of these terms, we have confirmation of their basic meaning. Ezekiel 45 uh, 10, you shall have righteous balances, a righteous ephah, a righteous bath. Those are all Hebrew measures and terms. Then the Old Testament also speaks of sacrifices of righteousness. Now, what would they be? They would be sacrifices that conformed to the revealed standard. Sacrifices of righteousness in Psalm 51, 19, for example, in Psalm 4, 5. Righteous conduct is conduct according to God's revealed standard. Righteousness in conduct is conduct according to a revealed standard. Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God. You see, to do all the statutes, the commandments, and so forth, to fear the Lord our God for good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. It shall be our righteousness if we do what he says. God counts obedience as righteousness. So right or wrong conduct is determined 
on the basis of whether or not you obey the revealed standard. And Christianity, whether it's Judaism in the Old Testament or Christianity in the New, is not just doing what we feel that we think is right or following our conscience, quote unquote, but it's obeying the revealed standard. Why would God give all this except for what he says he gives it for? All scriptures inspired of God and it's profitable. For what? Instruction, correction, doctrine, reproof, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's instruction in righteousness. All scripture. Now, righteousness, the reason we study the Old Testament, I keep emphasizing this, is so that you can understand the new and not only not teach or believe the wrong things by not knowing fail to do all God wants you to do. The reason we study the Old Testament is because you won't get a lot of things from the new if you ignore the old. Like righteousness preached from the pulpit Sunday after Sunday is just believing. You know, it's something in the abstract. But righteousness in the Bible is something you do. Now, it isn't works because the Bible completely refutes that. Uh, let's keep the balance that by grace are you saved, but we're not talking about getting saved. We're talking about conduct, righteousness as conduct. The way you obtain a righteous standing is through faith in Jesus. But you'll find, and this is why you need Old Testament training, that righteousness is what men do. It's an act. It's something they perform. Now, you need to be writing that. You really do. Righteousness in Hebrew thought is not simply an abstract moral principle but it's dynamic, it's expressed in activity. Now that's the most important thing we're going to say under this study, so you want to get it down. The Hebrew conceived of righteousness as a righteous act or event, something that actually happened. Righteousness was never in the abstract. A righteous man performed righteous acts. He didn't say, I'm righteous. He lived righteousness. Now you want to uh, look up these passages with me. Righteousness is what men are to do, is what we're saying. We'll give you the text and then we look, look, look at them. Righteousness are what, is what men are to do. Psalm 106 verse 3, Isaiah 58 2, Ezekiel 18 21 22, Genesis 18, 19, among other passages. And you see that righteousness here is seen as what men do. So we're back to New Testament teaching, James 2. If a man says he has faith without works, his faith is dead. Righteousness is what we do. You're not made righteous by doing anything. Keep the balance, but righteous conduct is what we have before us here. Psalm 106.3, Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. It's what you do. You can say you're saved, but Jesus says in Matthew 7, if the works don't follow, he says it's just a false confession. James 1 says the same thing. Be a doer, not just a hearer of the word. And Isaiah 58, verse 2. This can change the whole concept of your obedience to God. And those of you who have word ministries, your teaching ministry. That's why we stress the Sermon on the Mount so much in this church. Righteousness is what God expects us to do. We are counted as righteousness, as righteous, by faith. But we are to do righteousness. Isaiah 58, 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance. See, they did righteousness. Ezekiel 18, 21, 22. Now this couldn't be any plainer than Ezekiel makes it. That righteousness results in life, unrighteousness in death. But if the wicked man, verse 21, if the wicked man will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, right is righteous, you see, 
he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. See, it's what you do. God will never accept just your confession sitting back in a pew, I am righteous. He says, I want to see your righteousness and your conduct. And then Genesis 18, 19, without looking that up, that speaks of Abraham. God says there that uh, all the righteousness that he required Abraham and his seed will do. Again, he speaks of doing righteousness. God's deliverance of his people is called righteous acts. I'll just give you the text. We won't look them up. You might look at 1 Samuel 12, 7 and 8. Speaking here of deliverance and redemption. Isaiah 1, 27. Isaiah 46, 12 and 13. So even God's deliverance and redemption is called righteous acts. Righteousness is an act, in other words, not an abstract idea. In fact, it's a way of life in the Old Testament. Psalm 1, verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Well, the way of life is one's conduct, of course. But he knows the way, the conduct, the living of the righteous. And uh, Psalm 23, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. Well, that's righteous living, you see. Now, righteousness is also expressed as judgment in the Bible. And in this sense, it has the meaning of justice. Remember, the term means righteousness or justice. Righteousness is expressed in judgment, and in this sense, it is justice. Now, God is called the supreme judge in Genesis 18:25. And since righteousness is the standard by which God governs the world, the standard that he requires us to live by, it's also to be the standard by which he would judge the world. Psalm 9, 7, and 8. In other words, righteousness is what controls all divine attitude toward the world. He governs the world in righteousness. He requires us to follow his example and live righteously and he will judge the world Psalm 9, 7 and 8 in righteousness but the Lord shall endure forever he hath prepared his throne for judgment he shall judge the world in righteousness and he shall minister judgment to the peoples in uprightness so he judges the world in righteousness in righteousness by his standard of perfection, of course. He'll just draw the line and all who measure up to it will be declared righteous and those who do not will be unrighteous. Now justice carries with it the idea of absolute fairness. That's why the Hebrew terms we gave you sometimes should be translated righteousness and sometimes just or justice because justice has a little different meaning than righteousness. Justice has the idea of absolute fairness based on a righteous standard. That when God judges, he'll be absolutely fair and just. He'll judge us in righteousness, and but he will be just. You see, righteousness demands absolute conformity to God's standard, and justice visits all nonconformity with punishment. So those are the two sides of his righteousness. Righteousness demands conformity to God's standard, which is his own nature and character, of course, and justice visits all nonconformity with punishment. Now, it may be the loss of rewards for a Christian. It won't be necessarily a punishment in the sense of a penal punishment, but Justice visits all nonconformity with uh, loss of blessings or rewards for a Christian, premature death for some because they don't conform, don't shape up, as they say today. 
to eternal punishment for the lost. But he'll be absolutely fair and just. So the terms mean absolute fairness in his righteous judgment. And that, in that sense, it's justice. All right, so much for theological significance of righteousness. Now, that's just a basis. You can take in English, or if you've studied Hebrew, stud, take a Hebrew dictionary and teach yourself these doctrines. You see, we could spend a lot of time on any one and uh, look up a lot of texts that would be pertinent, but these are the basic things you need to know. But it's only the beginning. Now the love of God. Next. We've looked at several things, holiness, righteousness. Now love. Two basic terms for love in the Old Testament. And again, it's the Old Testament that helps you understand the new. The first term, ahava. That's the basic term for love. Then there's a second term that is quite common in the Old Testament, and it's chesed. Not kesed, but chesed. Hebrew. And that means, and you see this all the time, the King James, mercy or loving kindness. We sing a song, according to thy loving kindness. Well, that's chesed. Now, we have to distinguish between the terms because they're both translated to times love, but they don't mean the same thing in the Old Testament or in their quotations in the New. So we have to distinguish between the terms. Now the difference between the terms lies in the fact that hesed is always conditioned upon there being a covenant Without the prior existence of a covenant, like a covenant between God and Israel or man and man, there would be no chesed at all. Chesed is conditioned upon there being a covenant, and you'll see the significance of that in a moment. On the other hand, the other term, the ahava, which is a common, a common term for love in the Old Testament, it's unconditioned love. It's unconditioned. has nothing to do with a covenant. It has all to do with the will of the one who loves. He either wants to love or he doesn't. I mean, it's unconditional love, unconditioned love, I should say. Not unconditional, unconditioned. And thus it comes to be the term for election love in the Old Testament. Hesed is covenant love, but Ahava is election love. It's the love by which God chose Israel. When he speaks of choosing her, this term is used, electing her. It's election love. And so it's synonymous with grace. But hesed has to do with uh, God establishing a covenant with Israel, you see, and it's the love that exists in the covenant, or the relationship that exists in the covenant. As we'll see, it's Love is not the best translation of chesed at all, but it'll have a better translation, as we'll see in a moment. Now, it's in the sense of choice or election that ahava occurs, and chesed, as I say, is covenant. If you look at Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 9, you'll see both terms used, one of God's choice, and the other speaks of the covenant and chesed. Both terms, you can look it up in the Hebrew if you read it, Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 9. Here's where both terms occur together. Rather than look up a lot of passages that use the terms individually, it is more profitable maybe to see them together. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you. You see, he's talking about election, choice. He didn't set his love upon you or choose you because you're more in number than any people, for you were the fewness of all people. But because the Lord, and here's Ahava, the Lord loved you. See, it's unconditioned. It has nothing to do with whether or not 
they do or don't do anything. It's election love. Because God loved you. He didn't choose you because you were a great people, because he loved you. And because you would keep the oath which you had sworn to your fathers. That the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you out of the house of the bondman from the house of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we come to Hesed. <laughs> know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and Hesed with them that love him. Covenant and translated here mercy, generally translated mercy, loving kindness in the King James. But you see, when he deals with covenant, then he says hesed. He, God could just as easily have used the same term up there as election love. But you see, this is why we study, because they don't mean the same thing. Now, the root meaning of hesed is steadfastness. Remember, there are basic meanings. That's the only way you can know what words mean is to go to basic meanings. It basically means steadfastness and then mercy and loving kindness. Now, you may want to write this. There's no other way to get it down the way you would understand it. With what I've just said, then... Hesed is used to denote the attitude of loyalty. Hesed is used to denote the attitude of loyalty, faithfulness, and moral obligation, which both parties of a covenant observe toward one another. Hesed was the binding relationship in a covenant. It meant not merely love, but steadfast faithfulness. All right, Hesed is used to denote the attitude of loyalty, faithfulness, and moral obligation which both parties of a covenant observe toward one another. Hesed was the binding relationship in a covenant. It was steadfast faithfulness. Now you see, the term is generally translated love, sometimes mercy and loving kindness, but that doesn't tell you much. Like all through Hosea, so we'll see the term is used. And Hosea is talking about one thing, but to an English Western mind, you don't really grasp what he's saying unless you understand that it has to do with covenant, faithfulness, steadfastness in a covenant. I will give you one text for that, uh, 1 Samuel 20, verses 13 to 16. And here we have the covenant between David and Jonathan. You see, if you just translate it love, you miss the significance of what the term was intended to mean by the Old Testament writers. It's one thing to be able to read Hebrew and translate Hebrew into English. It's another thing to know Old Testament theology, and then you can translate the sense into your translation. Because so often in the King James is translated love when it should never be love it ought to be translated as steadfast faithfulness while I'm certainly not an advocate of the RSV I think they have a better translation on that word than the King James but I don't recommend you have one because they're off in so many places theologically that you wouldn't gain by it uh, 1 Samuel 20 the covenant between David and Jonathan you remember Saul is seeking David's life and Jonathan Saul's son Loves him as he loves his own soul. Loves David. And David is in hiding and Jonathan covenants with him to warn him if King Saul is still intending to kill him, he's going to warn him. And on the basis of this, Jonathan and David enter into a covenant whereby David, when he's made king, Jonathan believes he'll displace his father, by the way, when he becomes king that he'll show loving kindness or hesed to him. And so this is the covenant they make. Uh, let's begin reading verse 13. The Lord do so and much more to Jonathan, but if it please my father to do the evil, 
then I will show it thee and send thee away that thou mayest go in peace and the Lord be with thee as he has been with my father. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me hesed, the hesed of the Lord, that I die not. Translate here kindness, you see. But also thou shalt not cut off thy hesed, thy covenant faithfulness, kindness, from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, everyone in the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. So there you see the meaning of hesed very clearly, not between God and man, but hesed spoke of the relationship that two parties in a covenant or a contract or agreement uh, entered into. That the, the hesed is what sustained the covenant. So you can enter into a verbal agreement and the other person can deny it. But if hesed is present, now that's not just love, but that's steadfast faithfulness, uh, then the parties will keep the covenant. And so God elected Israel by Ahava love, but he entered into a covenant with them, and though she will not be faithful, he contends that he will keep hesed forever. In other words, his, his uh, faithfulness in the covenant. Hosea shows this more clearly than any of the uh, writers of the Old Testament. In fact, Hosea, if you, if you do any extra reading, you'll find he's called the prophet of Hesed. We point this out in our book, Old Testament Prophets, but you'll see that used by many writers, the prophet of Hesed. Now, why is he called the prophet of Hesed? Because Hosea, more than anyone else, has had to live this out in his experience. Because of his relationship to adulterous Gomer, his wife, that Hosea was required of God to maintain his faithfulness to the covenant of marriage and take her back. A steadfast love or steadfast faithfulness was the idea, which would be a, a uh, prophecy acted out in Hosea's life of God's relationship to Israel of God remaining faithful like Hosea was to remain faithful to his adulterous wife, God was going to remain faithful to adulterous Israel. So the book of Hosea is written to demonstrate that. And all through the term hesed is used. If you read it in the Hebrew, you see it occurring again and again. Uh, chapter 6 is a good example where hesed is used over and over. God says Israel's hesed is as Transient as the morning cloud, it just passes away. Verse 4 of chapter 6, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is like a morning cloud. Well, the word goodness is hesed. See there, they've translated by a word that it doesn't even mean goodness. So there is a perfect example of a mistranslation. He said, your faithfulness, your steadfast love or faithfulness to the covenant passes like the morning cloud. And in verse 6, it was chesed that the Lord required from Israel rather than outward ritual. Verse 6, I desired mercy and not sacrifice. Well, mercy is chesed. Jesus quotes this in the New Testament to the Pharisees, remember. When they tithe even the little herbs in their garden. They were careful to do that. But he said, what I desired was, you shouldn't have neglected tithing, speaking to the Jew. Speaking to the Jew, tithing. That's under law. For us, it's everything. Consecration of everything. But he said, you should not have neglected that. And he spoke to them before the cross. That's significant. People try to use that to justify tithing by a Christian getting bound to 10% legalism instead of reading the principles of the New Testament which shows that everything belongs to Christ like Mark 10 but he quoted this and said it wasn't just the tithing that God required but mercy and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings well it's chesed that God wanted not just sacrifices and tithes Israel's faithlessness is described as a violation of covenant. Next verse. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. You see how hesed and covenant go together in the Old Testament. 
God says that Hesed is lacking altogether in the land. Chapter 4, 1 and 2. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with inhabitants of the land because there's no truth, there's no Hesed, there's no knowledge of God in the land. Mercy, of course, anytime you see mercy or loving kindness, you know it's Hesed. He sees nothing but swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery, blood, and so forth. Israel may forget her Hesed, but God will not forget his. Chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. And in that day I will make a covenant. We're back to covenant and Hesed. I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, with the creeping things of the ground. I will break the bow of the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment, in loving kindness, in Hesed. See, in mercies. Covenant and Hesed again. God's going to make a new covenant. And because his chesed is steadfast, then he will not break covenant. And one day they will be the same. So the prophet all through the book exhorts that the people keep, keep and do chesed. 10, 12, 12, 6, for example. Do chesed, he says. Well, do you have any questions thus far on righteousness and love? These are some foundational things. As we said at the outset, eventually, in Old Testament theology, you'll find that uh, all of this begins to fit together and help you understand the whole Bible. A little bit here and a little bit there will give you basic truths that you won't have to ask, what does this verse mean? or what should I do in this or that situation? It's just paying the cost. Yeah, that's right. Paying the cost of study. We're told, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Are we talking then about this, this attainment of doing right in God's eyes for the uh, legal righteousness? No, he's talking about righteous acts in the Sermon on the Mount. They that hunger and thirst after the righteous life. Yeah. because the whole sermon has to do with doing he's only speaking to those under grace anyway you see that have already obtained righteousness by faith I thought God used in reference to man or just in reference to God no you mean does God only use it no it uh, it occurs occasionally of man uh, not not often like uh, David's love for his first wife, I think this term is used, that sort of thing. But that's, again, why just learning a Hebrew word and its meaning is not sufficient. We have to see how it's used, and that's what biblical study is all about. We see how it's used. You trace out all of the usages. You see, for me, originally, to make a study like this, I have to do all the possibilities. And then you come to conclusions that, well, this is used, like Hesed is used mostly in the covenant relationship. And it doesn't mean love as such, it means steadfast faithfulness. And uh, so on. Now, related to the studies and the meanings of words is the next subject we're going to deal with, and that's the names of God in the Bible. But we don't limit it just to the names of God, but to Hebrew names as such. We've stressed many times that in Hebrew a name of a person or place or thing is not necessarily limited or seldom is it limited just to identify a person. Like that's John or that's Peter. But Peter means rock, you see. And therefore when they named a child they said he's going to be like a rock. Or names would get changed, like Abram to Abraham. Abram means exalted father to Abraham, father of a multitude. After God made the promise that your descendants would be like the stars in multitude, the sands of the sea, he changed his name to say that. So names and words and terms in the Hebrew language are quite significant. And again, it helps you to be a better expounder of the word and understand it. 
So I've got quite a bit here, and uh, I've, you can write what you think is important, and if you want me to repeat, why you say so. But I feel like this is a very important part of our study. We're going to be dealing with the significance of names in Hebrew, and then we'll come to a second aspect of this, uh, the meaning of the divine names, like El, Elyon, Elohim, Yahweh, and so forth, what the names mean. But no less important is the uh, understanding of the significance of names in the Hebrew language. Now, you might want to make a note of that, that among the Hebrews, that a name, say the name of a person, was never, never merely a title, but it was often descriptive. See, names of persons, places, and things are very important in the Hebrew language because they, they often have uh, spiritual significance. Now, there are about six categories. I'll give you the six, and then we'll give you examples of each. I think this would sum up names in Hebrew, what we say here. Names, whether of person, place, or thing. Now, we're not distinguishing there. Names, one, are descriptive of the nature, character, appearance, or function of a person, place, or thing. Descriptive of appearance, nature, character, function. Secondly, names represent, secondly, some relationship may represent some relationship. Like uh, dan a -el means God is my judge. Eel, name for God. So that expresses relationship. But we'll give you examples later. It may thirdly express piety, sorrow, grief, joy, or hope. Names can express piety, sorrow, grief, joy, hope, and so on. Fourthly, names are given sometimes to express gratitude, thanks, and praise. Samuel was so named, for example. Sometimes it expresses gratitude, thanks, and praise, a name. Sometimes names are paranomastic. There's no other word, so I just have to use the one in the dictionary. Paranomastic. If you, any of you have gotten as far as college, you remember in poetic literature, paranomasia? Well, we'll explain. It, anywhere, it's, it's a play on words, and that often occurs in the Old Testament, a play on words. Book of Micah has a lot of that. And sixthly, whatever it is, occasionally names are prophetic. Now, examples of all of these. Uh, I'll just go through the whole six, but you can pretty well see the relationship. For example, Esau means Harry. Now, we said... Let's get where we are. We said names describe appearance. Okay, now this would, under the first category, we're talking about. We're taking these in order. One, two, three, four, five, six. Esau means Harry. Now when was he named Esau? Well, Genesis 25, 25, at his birth. He came out, he looked like what? A hairy garment. <clears throat> So his mother didn't pick a name, say, I think I'll call him uh, John or Joseph or Harry. <laughs> H-A-R-R-Y, but I'll call him Esau. Since she didn't speak English, Esau meant Harry. H-A-I-R-Y. <laughs> oh, boy. Just as the nature, we said appearance, nature, and all these things. I'm still under category one. Just as the nature of the Dead Sea caused the Hebrews to call it the Salt Sea. 
Now, we call it the Dead Sea. They didn't. They called it the Salt Sea. Why? Because it's filled with salt. Genesis 14, 3. You couldn't drown the Dead Sea if you tried. You dive in, you come right back up. Now, a lot of examples. I'm not going to uh, give you all that I've gotten. I wrote an article for a Bible encyclopedia, and I'm just trying to pick out the most important. But you have to keep in mind about the Hebrew that is quite descriptive. Now, the function, we're, we're still under number one, aren't we? Yes, function. The function of Eve as the mother of all living. That's what Genesis, how it describes her. She's the mother of all living. The function of Eve suggested her name to Adam. Adam named her, and he didn't name her Eve. Eve is quite late in history. Eve doesn't mean a thing to the Hebrew. You know what Eve's name is? It's Kava. Kava is her name. That would be transliterated C-H-A-V-V-A-H. -V You'd never recognize her, Adam and Kava, would you? But you would be correct. Kava means life. And that suggested her name. She's the mother of all living. Genesis chapter 3 tells you that. Other functions are seen in Obed, name Obed, which means servant. Or Canaan, the land of Canaan, which means merchant. The Canaanites were businessmen, merchants. So names always had a meaning. Even the letters had meanings. See, like a house, Baith stood for a house. Bait was a house. Rosh was a head. Lamad was a shepherd's staff. A valve, a nail. And every letter in Hebrew had a meaning. I've got a book that gives them all. I never particularly tried to remember them because uh, early the language was a pictographic language. All right, the second category, we gave you six. Human relationships, we're talking about relationships, are suggested by such names as Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar meaning son of. Human relationship, like Simon Bar Jonah, means son of Jonah. A spiritual relationship, like Jedediah. Who was Jedediah in the Old Testament? You get a hundred today if you can answer that one. Somebody said it, I heard it. Solomon. David called him Solomon. God called him Jedediah. That shows spiritual relationship. It means beloved of Yahweh. Beloved of the Lord. Beloved of Yahweh. See, any name that ends in I-A-H, I and Y are the same in Hebrew, and that's the abbreviation for Yah, Yahweh. And geographical relationship is in the name Zerubbabel. Now, we've studied Zerubbabel. Z-U-R-A-B. Always have to remember where the B comes. Second. Means born in Babel, or Babylon. That's where Zerubbabel was born. Begotten in Babylon. Then, a third category, spiritual parents reflected their piety by compounding children's names with God's name. They would either compound it with Ale or with Yahweh. Joel, Joel. The Old Testament's filled with this, where they compound the name of the child with God's. Joel, Yahweh is God. See, Jo would be for Yahweh and Ale for God. Yahweh is God. Daniel, Daniel, Ale is my judge. God is my judge. Elijah, Eli, Yah. You see, Yah for Yahweh. My God is Yahweh. Eli, my God is Yah. Eli, El is God. E is the pronoun. Eli, my God, Yah. Elijah. The 
then grief and sorrow are expressed in some names in the Old Testament. Like Phineas' wife, he was uh, one of the sons of uh, the high priest Eli, you know, the sinful sons. So Phineas' wife named her son Ichabod. I-C-H-A-B-O-D. She named her son Ichabod. She died in childbirth, which means inglorious. She said, for the glory has departed from Israel, Ichabod. And Rachel, she died in childbirth. She called her son Benjamin, Benoni, B-E-N-O-N-I. She said, his son is Benoni, and that means son of my sorrow. It's interesting that they didn't have names so they saw the child or till they had the experience. So often in the Old Testament that's true. Saw Esau and called him Harry. Remember that. <laughs> However, hope is expressed in the name Isaiah. Isaiah means salvation is of Yah or Yahweh. Salvation is of the Lord. Be interesting for you to find out what your name means, because it does have a meaning if you can trace it back. Not hard to figure out. Carpenter, their, their ancestors were carpenters. Miller, they were millers. Freemans were free men. <laughs> Still are, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's right. Praise and gratitude are indicated by the name Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L, Ishmael. Remember when Hagar named her son Ishmael? Well, remember Sarah drove her out, and God appeared to her in the wilderness, <clears throat> told her to go back and be obedient to Sarah and to Abraham. And when her son was born, she named her son God Hears. That's what Ishmael means, Ale Hears. So that was thanks or praise, you see, praise, gratitude. And other names, uh, as I say. Then paranomasia, that other term we use back there, paranomastic words. Paranomasia, you just add an I-A on there. Which means a play on words is evident in many names in the Old Testament means a play on words. Naomi, in the book of Ruth, Naomi, that means pleasant. But she lost her sons and her husband down in Moab. And remember when she came back, they said, how are you, Naomi? Good to see you after so many years. She says, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. She changed her own name. That's a play on words. M-A-R-A, -A, Mara, bitter because of her loss. And then in Nabal, Nabal, remember Nabal? In the Old Testament and David and his wife, Nabal's wife, Abigail, and Nabal wouldn't give anything to David's men uh, who were fleeing from Saul. He said, who's David? I've never heard of David. Saul is king. And David <clears throat> gathered his men together to go take it and uh, Abigail, Nabal's wife, knew what would happen if he did. Nabal, in Hebrew, that's his name, Nabal, it means fool. <laughs> and so she said to David, fool is his name, and as his name is, so is he. Yeah. <laughs> that's 1 Samuel 25. 25, 25. Fool is his name, and folly is with him. He acted like what he had been named. wonder why a parent would ever call a child. That in <laughs> Prophetic, I guess. <laughs> Jacob means supplanter. Remember, Esau was the eldest. He started to come out of the womb first, and then Jacob supplanted him. He came out first, you know, the twins in the womb. And uh, so she called Esau Harry because he looked Harry. Jacob, because he took the place of Harry, she called him supplanter, or Jacob. 
might be interesting if some of you, when you have babies, wait and let the Lord guide you in a name <laughs> when you see the child. Oh. <laughs> well, enough of that. <laughs> Prophetic significance is found in names. I think this is number six before we get to divine names next time. Prophetic significance is found in certain names, like Isaiah's children. One he called Shear Jashub. Shear Jashub, which in Hebrew means a remnant shall return. So his name is a remnant shall return. That isn't a name at all. But then no names are really names. They describe something. Now, generally, we just pick out a cute name, Judy, Hobart. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know what they were thinking about. <laughs> I really, I really do. I had an uncle named Hobart. That was it. But uh, <laughs> names, names meant something. Now they're just something. Well, what will sound good, you know? But the first two, I was unsaved. Then when Becky was born, uh, I had been saved, and uh, she was born when we, when we went off to college. And I actually picked a biblical name because, you know, names mean something. So her. Her name in Hebrew is Rivka, but it's, of course, anglicized as Rebecca. So you could look in the Bible and get words for grace, peace, love, mercy in the Greek or the Hebrew, and they could come out to beautiful names. I mean, like Rebecca. There's only one so named because we had no uh, actual motivation for doing that before. But Shir Jashub is not a name, it's a phrase, a remnant shall return. Then his other son was much longer, my hair shall allow hashbaz. <laughs> you want me to write it or you want to look it up? That's right in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 8, you can see all this. And he tells you the meanings there. You don't even have to know the Hebrew. My hair shall allow hashbaz means the spoil speeds and the prey hastens. <laughs> How would you like to name your son that? The spoil speeds and the prey hastens. See, one reflected hope prophetically and the other reflected judgment prophetically. The spoil speeds the prey hastens means that the enemies of Israel come in and take them as prey and take their goods as spoil, and it's going to happen quickly. Then Hosea's children are prophetic. Jezreel. J-E-Z-R-W-L. Jezreel. God sows. Sows, S O W S, means judgment. And these are right in chapter 1 of Isaiah, Lo Ruhama and uh, Lo Ami. Lo Ruhama and Lo Rami. Lo Ruhama, not pitied. Raham is pity. And Lo Ami, Lo is not in Hebrew. Am. You want to remember what Am is? People, and E is the pronoun, not my people. God was saying in the naming of Hosea's children, Israel is not my people. Now, the term in uh, the New Testament, we'll close with this today, translated Christ is the Hebrew Messiah, Mashiach, the Messiah which literally means anointed or anointed one. So Christ is not his name. Jesus is his name. Christ is his function, his title, his office. But it becomes to be personalized as a compound name. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, or just Jesus, or just Christ. But the word Christ in Greek, in the Hebrew, was Mashiach, Messiah, which means anointed one. So again, his name, Jesus, means deliverer, our Savior. Christ means the anointed one, the one that God anointed and sent. So again, always names mean something. Now next time we'll get into the divine names and uh, see the meanings of those.